Welcome to Naturistic, a biology podcast focusing on ecology, evolution, plants, and animals. I'm Nash Turley, a biologist, and each episode I'll research a specific subject and present what I've learned to my co-host, Hamilton Boyce. This episode, we discuss lysenid butterflies and their interactions with ants. All right. Well, welcome uh, to whatever this podcast is called. I think we'll find it out eventually. But my name is Nash Turley, and uh, the goal is to talk about a topic in biology, ecology and evolution and plants and animals and things like that with my friend Hamilton Boyce. Hello. I am a biologist, so I presumably know more about these things. And uh, the topic we're selecting, Hamilton, uh, has not been prepared for. No. This is ideal for me. I have zero preparation necessary. <laughs> Just go in blindly. That, but you have the obligation to be um, you know, charming and entertaining. Right. <laughs> Good luck. The starting point for this topic is ants. We've, we've done several projects involving ants, but this is uh, revolving in some way around ants again. Nice. I love so, ants. Nice. Yeah. I remember in undergrad, you, were, you did a project on ants and were always convincing me that they were really cool. <laughs> and for some reason, I was always like, I don't know, ants, I guess. <laughs> you were not sold on ants being cool, man. Well, <laughs> but a decade later, I think I'm, I'm on board now. <laughs> Perfect. So ants are super intense predators. Um, they are incredibly abundant and they prey on just about everything. They're such important predators and so dominant in ecosystems. It's estimated that about 100,000 insect species have evolved some sort of associations with ants. Hmm. And like, it's always just kind of a number. But if we think of like diversity of life on Earth, like there's something like 10,000 species of birds. So having 100,000 and probably many more that are really closely associated with ants is like a huge amount yeah. of diversity. And when you say because they're predators, is that because all these species are presumably developing responses to their predatory behavior? Or is that just kind of a separate, a side note? Well, some of them, you know, some of these associations are... Uh, things that have evolved uh, ways to defend against ants. So that's some of that 100,000. But many of the other 100,000 are, instead of just defending against them, it's ways of like working with them or yeah. being uh, mutualist with them. Nice. So those are called um, myrmecophile. Myrmeco being kind of the root that's often used for ants and phile being love. So there's tons of myrmecophiles. And so one of them is aphids. And basically what aphids do is they feed on plants and then they secrete this stuff called honeydew. So they suck up juice from the plants and juice from plants is basically just a bunch of sugar mm -hmm. and it's kind of hard to build an insect body on just sugar. So they secrete a lot of that extra sugar um, and kind of accumulate the other nutrients like nitrogen and stuff. So they have all this basically sugar water they're squirting out their butt um, and ants come along and they drink that. And this creates this interaction between ants and aphids called uh, tending, where the ants will come up to the aphids and drink the honeydew. Um, so that's kind of what the aphids are giving to the ants. And as a uh, a reward or as a you know a mutual interaction, the ants then protect the aphids from other predators. Hmm. Okay. Right. Because they don't want to lose their sweet source of ant butt juice. Yeah, exactly. So they're, it's, a, it's, a, it's a resource for them. So they're sort of protecting their resource by keeping away other predators. Yeah. Um, so this was thought to be a classic example of a mutualism. And in many cases, it, it is. So it's beneficial to both the ants and the aphids. Although there's lots of cases where maybe it's not so great for the ants, like they're giving a bunch of extra nutrients to the ants or they're being harassed and stuff. So it's not always a mutualism, but mm -hmm. often it is. It's not always it's not always beneficial for the aphids, right? Yeah. Okay. I think in in this interaction, I haven't heard of situations where it's detrimental to the ants mm -hmm. because I think it's always beneficial to them. They have the power the power move. Yeah, I, there's almost certainly exceptions to that. You know, the things we'll talk about later sort of hint at that. Not with aphids, but probably aphids are manipulating them to some extent. But I haven't seen research on that. Mm -hmm. And then this all this interaction can have other big consequences because 
all those ants can keep away other herbivores. So looking across all the studies, it it looks like on average, um, this tends to be beneficial to the plant as well. Because okay. although all, there's lots of aphids feeding on the plant, that all the ants tend to keep away other herbivores. Ah, interesting. So the, so the ants are into the aphids, and the aphids are into the plants, and the ants protect the aphids, who then also, as a byproduct, protect the plants. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And actually, a study I worked on found that same result. We, we sprayed to get rid of the aphids, and then that resulted in more herbivory and lower plant fitness right. because grasshoppers ate the plants a whole bunch. Yeah. But uh, So yeah, so that, that is an example of these sort of plant-ant-insect relationship, this complex interactions. Yeah. But there's a lot of other types of interactions that go into, and there's also about 10,000 species of insects that have evolved to be parasites of ants. And so instead of being mutual interactions, they're like preying on them in some way or living in their nest or taking advantage of these dense colonies of, of ants in some way or another. Mm. So 10,000 out of 100,000 interactions or species who have relationships with ants. So like 10% of them are just there to mess with them and not right. to re- give anything in return, basically. <laughs> Yeah. So essentially like you have, you know, dense colonies, you know, lots of organisms living together that are really abundant. That is a resource that can be exploited. So it's kind of a universal thing in nature. If there's lots of something, there's going to be something that evolves to parasitize it in some way. Right. Just in the same way that, you know, humans have, you know, we have fleas and um, viruses and all sorts of stuff that take advantage of abundant humans. Right. Um, so these include like mites Don't that get in ant nests. Don't talk about viruses. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not a not an exciting topic during these times. So there's uh, mites that live in um, parasitized ants. There's uh, flies, surfid flies that live in ant colonies and eat their babies. Hmm. There's a bunch of predatory beetles that'll live in their nests. There's even crickets and cockroaches that'll live in ant nests. Oh. Um, and then yeah, fungi and bacteria and stuff as well. Right. So there's one group of insects that you wouldn't really think of being involved in all this, which is butterflies. Hmm. Uh, And that's that's because uh, about 99% of butterflies are are strictly herbivorous. They do what we think of butterflies doing. They have caterpillars that eat leaves or other parts of plants. Then they pupate and turn into butterflies that fly around and mate. And then it starts over again. So they're super tightly associated with plants. And that's true for about, yeah, almost all butterflies. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, however, there are some butterflies that are closely associated with ants, um, and some of them have mutualistic interactions like the aphids do, where they secrete liquids. But then some butterflies are actually predators of ants. Whoa. I just have this visual of like a butterfly flying, and there's just like just crowds of ants like just camped out on their wings as they're like flapping along. <laughs> Yeah, I, I guess, you know, saying that there's butterflies that are predators is like maybe not giving the right image because it's not, I don't know of any examples where the adult butterflies okay, are preying yeah, yeah. on ants. It's it's the caterpillars. Um, so you're saying like, you know, my, my psychedelic visual is not an accurate portrayal of what you're about to tell me? No, but there is one situation that we'll get to that does have this, you know, where ants are interacting directly with the adults. Um, but most of the action is with the larva, which is the caterpillars. Mm-hmm. Um, and as I said, some of them are even predators, uh, which is kind of the main, one of the main focus um, that we're talking about. So the main topic, that's as it, that's sort of an introduction between ants um, and, and what they do with other insects. The main topic is the group called Lycenids, which is a, a, a group of butterflies. Um, they often have um, common names of a blue or hair streak. So mm-hmm. they're these really small butterflies. If you've ever seen like a, a small butterfly flitting around that is blue when it flaps its wings, mm-hmm. that's probably a lysenid. Okay. Are they um, just everywhere and, pretty much or? Yeah, yeah. There's, you know, like most insect groups, they're incredibly diverse. There's about 6,000 species. Okay. Probably, probably many more. They're, yeah, they're everywhere. Yeah. Um, and then uh, about 70% of species of lysenids are associated with ants in some way or another. Okay. 
So it's like a really common trait among that group um, of butterflies Mm -hmm. uh, where, you know, out of butterflies as a whole, very few are. Uh, But in in the Lycaenids, it's pretty common. And so these interactions can take two sort of broad categories that can be called facultative, which means they're not super tightly associated with ants. So they will eat plants mostly, but they might be tended by ants, but they don't require ants to live. Hmm. And if they are associated with ants, it's probably like more general, like a variety of species of ants. So that's facultative. Okay. And then there's also um, lysenids that are obligate, which means they're always associated with ants, at least at some part of their life stage. Mm -hmm. And in the wild, they can't survive without ants. And then normally these are more specialized, so like associated with this specific species or group of, or a collection of ant species. Mm -hmm. So one of them is eating ants for dessert and one of them eats ants three meals a day, so to speak. (laughs) Well, most of the facultative, I don't think any of the facultative are predatory. Okay. They're, They're only doing sort of those maybe like associations or more like mutualistic interactions. Right. Um, where the obligate ones are the ones that um, tend to be predatory okay, or more, more likely to be predatory. Mm-hmm. With thousands of species, there's, there's exceptions to probably all of these right. general statements. But uh, you know, if you're going to be a predator, you're going to have to have a much tighter association. And if you're evolving to feed on an ant, that's probably going to be like, you're probably not going to be like, well, this time I can't feed on ants. I'll just get by on plants. Like They really require that. Right. I haven't heard of ones where they like, sometimes eat ants but then otherwise don't like if they i think for the most part they evolved to be a predator like yeah that's something they need to do it's not like well i'm i'm bored with ants i'm gonna i'm gonna have some like uh avocado cucumber (laughs) sushi rolls or something right and so it's pretty rare still though so among uh it's about three percent of lysenids that are uh parasitic or predatory on ants so it, we're, the numbers are dropping and dropping. So it's still pretty rare among the Lycaenids, but 3% of, you know, the number I see here is about six, 600 species that have been discovered so far that are uh, predatory or parasitic on ants. Okay. And they'll Sorry, normally... can you just do a quick reminder? So the the Lycaenids are the, the ones that... Uh, Three meals a day on ants? Or what? I, I forgot the, the scientific terms yeah. here already. Yeah, the the Lycaenids. We could call them, I don't know, blues or oh, right, right. That's whatever. just the general group. That the whole we're talking the whole about. group. Okay, yeah, the, the whole group of butterflies with six thousand species. Right, where most of them are associated with ants in some way. Got it. Um, only three percent are actually predators. Okay, cool. or like eating ants in yeah. some way. So we're getting a smaller and smaller percentage of the Lycaenids, and a way even smaller percentage of all butterflies. Mm-hmm. So. Across the world, it's pretty rare, right? But they're so diverse; it's still a lot. Like mm-hmm. they've discovered at least six hundred species that do this, and there's probably many more. Wild. Um, and they'll eat ant eggs. They can eat the larva. They can eat the pupa, um, or they can eat ant regurgitations, which is the most specific thing that we'll get into mm-hmm. later. Yummy. Uh, so they they've evolved a, a bunch of variety of ways of feeding on ant parts. Mm-hmm. And so to do all this, this group of butterflies has a a bunch of crazy adaptations. Let's see. How would you describe an adaptation? Do you have a definition for that? An adaptation is a characteristic or a behavior that has come about through evolution or natural selection that allows an organism to do something that they need to do. Well, even... Do they need, always need to do it? Yeah, something like that. Yeah, that's great. So yeah, basically a, a, some trait of some sort that helps them survive. Right. And yeah, like you said, it, it makes the most sense if it evolved in response to some selective pressure. So if we're thinking about Lycaenids, have, like part of their selection, the natural selection imposed on them is that they're associated with ants. These are a few things that help them do that. Mm-hmm. So one of them is they have a really thick skin that can be up to 20 times thicker than other um, caterpillars. Wow. So if they're like getting bit or interacting, that that helps them. They also have these single-celled glands um, on their body that secrete these substances that can um, 
have like hormones and various things in them that can change ant behavior. Whoa. Uh, so these are pretty specialized glands. That's a very uh, on point adaptation there. Like a bag of magic that they just throw at ants and get them to do like <laughs> casting spells. Right. There's um, They also have this thing called a tentacle organ, which is essentially like, imagine if they had like a um, a rubber glove that can be like pulled inward where it's like inside their body and then they can inflate it. So it shoots out and all these fingers poke out. So oh. it can, it's basically like it can be retracted and then poked out and have all these like fingers on it. Whoa. And, uh, those fingers sec- can, sec- um, uh, what's not secrete. Is that the word? Yeah. Release, um, volatile compounds that ants that can attract ants or influence ant behavior in some way. Wild. Yeah. So that, and then, they also have another type of organ called a dorsal nectary organ that can secrete honeydew-like liquid, similar to what aphids do. So it's like a nutritious um, liquid that ants can suck up. And then the final one is they, uh, they have sound-producing organs that create a whole bunch of different sounds, which are shown to interact with ant behavior that we'll talk a bit more about in a mm. study. So it's a pretty long list. So we have, yeah, the gooey secretions that have uh, manipulating hormones there's the um the bag of magic <laughs> the bag of magic <laughs> and then the um the the tough skin and the the yeah. rubber glove that secretes volatiles All right um and the the sugary liquid and the sound producing things right the the boom box right yeah yeah so with all those adaptations they've used them to help them have four different types of lifestyles um, or life cycles. Okay. So the one is just the kind of normal butterfly thing that doesn't have anything to do with ants. They eat plants, they turn into butterflies, repeat. So this that's uh, the second type of lifestyle style is they live on plants, but they are associated with ants, but they're tended by them. So that's like the facultative. Mm-hmm. And they may use those you know various secretions and stuff to in- interact or communicate with the ants. Mm-hmm. The next one is they can live on a plant for a while and then... Uh, ants come about and they're like, man, you smell good. And the ants will pick them up and carry them back to their nest what? where they will then eat their larva. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's uh, a fun interaction there. Yeah. So that's like the, that's where those like the smells and the manipulation hormones and stuff come in. Yeah. So they're, they're really like uh, changing the way they smell. It's so that, you know, ants are so focused on, smells Mm -hmm. that they basically smell them like oh that's a larva i'm gonna Mm -hmm. take it back to the nest what are you doing out here and then once they get to the nest they're they don't even notice that they're eating their babies because they just smell like another larva so it pretty much turns itself into a trojan horse where it's like here take this cool thing that you're gonna love and then instead of spitting out soldiers it just starts chomping on the babies (laughs) exactly uh, and then the next one, which is the most complicated one, starts the same. They're, they're, the eggs are laid on a plant normally. And then an ant finds them, probably drawn in by the smells. They bring them back to the nest. But instead of the the caterpillar feeding on the other larva like a predator, it tricks the ant so much that the ants feed the caterpillar. So they regurgitate into the mouth of the caterpillar Whoa. and nur- nurse it all the way through its whole life cycle until it pupates and turns into an adult butterfly. Wow. Quite the treatment there. Is there like, is there understanding as to why they, why the ants think that's the right move? What they can tell now is that it seems to be mostly, um, those, um, olfactory manipulations. Mm -hmm. Um, I think there's still, there's still some debate. Like some people aren't convinced that that's the whole story. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's probably mostly that, um, there's also some aspects with the sounds. Yeah. You know, it's still, I think somewhat, somewhat up in the air exactly right. how they, how they do that. But there's some kind of some process to basically hotwire their, their instincts to just feed them instead of their own children. Yeah. Right. And yeah. And, and that approach is actually from the caterpillars perspective is much more efficient. They can actually have way more caterpillars in the nest, because they're not killing the ants. Right. They're they basically have servants that tend to them. Whereas the um the ones that eat the nest, they if they get too many caterpillars in the nest, they can kill the nest and 
kill off the ants. Right. Um, it's way way less efficient. Mm-hmm. Um, so the the most kind of advanced in a way is is the cuckoo. It's like similar to cuckoo birds that mm. lay their eggs in the um, nest of other birds, and then the those other species raise their babies for them. It's right. the same idea. Yeah. Um, is that like what cowbirds do? Yeah, exactly. Cowbirds do that. Um, so cuckoo is kind of the broad term. There's cuckoo wasp and there's cuckoo bees. There's all sorts of cuckoo things in nature including cuckoo butterflies. Ah. Clever little cuckoos. <laughs> yeah. So I have three studies uh, to cover that kind of stu- are experiments that get at th- those different lifestyles. Okay. So the first one is a, um, in 1981, and it's just a beautiful, really simple study. I love it when you have these like little simple studies. So the the big question of this study was to see if um, the ants interacting with the caterpillars um, could potentially protect the cat- the um, caterpillars from parasitoids. Um, I I don't know. Have you heard of parasitoids before? Is that is that is ha- it? You have a definition for that? Uh, I mean, is it different than something that parasitizes something else? Um, it's a special type of parasitism. Okay. So I would uh, say I do normal- not know about paras- paratoid- parasitoids. Yeah. So the simplest definition is a parasitoid always kills its host, Mm. where lots of parasites don't necessarily kill their host. Right. Um, So the the type of parasitoid, the life cycle of the type of parasitoid we're talking about um, is similar to the movie Alien, where there's a wasp or a fly that comes up to a host Mm -hmm. and it has it lays its eggs inside the host. So Mm -hmm. it has like an, an ovipositor. It stabs into the host and injects an egg inside the caterpillar right and then that that egg hatches inside the body and it eats the inside of the caterpillar while keeping the host alive so Mm. it it, it's eating it while still alive and in this case the caterpillar will live all the way up until it's about to pupate Mm -hmm. and then um at around that time the wasp will have pupated inside the caterpillar and then hatch and then burst out from the body of the caterpillar um killing it just like (laughs) in the alien I, yeah, or I would, my preferable reference would be The Thing, but it's the exact same interaction there. Oh, it, that was in that, oh, okay, I don't remember that. Or I don't even know if I've seen that. If you haven't seen The Thing, I mean, maybe The Thing is from the 80s, so maybe, well, actually, the original thing is from, I think, the 50s or the 60s, so I take that back. But um, but yeah, it's uh, maybe my favorite sci-fi movie of all time, probably. Wait, is that is wait, is that the one where they're in Antarctica? Yeah. Oh yeah. You and I watched that one time. Okay. I think. Yeah, I thought, but, I yeah. thought you had seen it. Yeah. I guess I don't remember that it had that that life cycle. But yeah, that's I mean it's I think I know the alien took inspiration from the life cycles of these wasp. Mm. Um wild. Like so yeah, it's one of the most um efficient and gruesome things that happens in nature. Yeah. That's, but that's it's also brutal. incredibly common, um, and so it's one of the biggest things that um, affects um, butterfly populations is parasitoids, because that's like the biggest, one of the biggest threats to caterpillars is um, parasitoid wasp okay. and flies. Yeah. So in in uh, on these uh, blue butterflies in Colorado, um, it's Burkhanid wasp, which is a certain family of wasp. And tachinid flies, which is another f- whole family of flies that mostly lives this parasitoid life cycle. Mm-hmm. And so the caterpillars in the study in Colorado feed on lupin, um, which are beautiful flowers. Often they grow like kind of boom and bust. They'll cover an area um, as these big, tall, normally blue flowers. Um, and But they normally live pretty short. So the caterpillars kind of have to, if they're going to live on them, they have got to go quick. Mm-hmm. Um and so these um, blue butterflies are specialists on the lupins, and uh, they're tended by ants. So they're more this facultative interaction where they're they're not predators of the ants. They're just interacting with the ants. And the ants will start to tend the caterpillars after the third instar. So it, an instar is like every time a caterpillar molts, it goes to the next instar. Right. Um, so they normally have like five or six, I think. So mm-hmm. it's like halfway through the development it starts being tended by ants. I assume maybe it doesn't secrete the liquid before that or something. I don't know. How would you relate instars to Pokemon? 
<laughs> or <laughs> pre- precursor, yeah. are you familiar with the way that Pokemon evolve or what, whatever the term is that they use? As far as I know, Pokemon essentially have like a larval stage and adult stage, but I don't know if they have different stages before they get to the final stage, but maybe they do. That's, I don't really know. I know there's at least like some of them have at least three stages. I think some of them are, are two, but so an okay. instar is more, is more confined to one of the life cycle stages. Yeah. Instars are just in the, so like among insects that go through metamorphosis, like butterflies and beetles and flies they have a a, a larval stage mm-hmm. and then they go through metamorphosis and then they have the adult which is normally the thing we're more familiar with a fly a butterfly a beetle those are all the adults right but the the larval stage are where really most of the action happens that's mm-hmm. where they do most of their feeding and those they molt several times um because they're growing like most of their growth happens in the juvenile stage okay got so it. they'll they'll start as an a, a tiny little egg and then they'll be like minuscule and then they'll grow a bit and then molt, shed their skin. Yeah. Um, and then they'll grow more. They'll grow more. Right. So, yeah. So in the third instar, after they've shed their skin three times, they'll start being interacting with ants. And in the study, they found that like once they start interacting with ants, they basically are the ants love it. Like they don't go away. They're going to be there for the rest of the caterpillar's life. Huh. Interesting. And so for this study, what they did is they found 100, over 100 plants in the wild that had caterpillars on them. And then this was, they used those plants to conduct an experiment. So on half the plants, they excluded ants and they kept ants by using this stuff called tanglefoot. And so uh, tanglefoot is essentially this like sticky substance that you can put on stuff and ants can't crawl over it. Mm. So they, they clear away the other plants from that are touching the lupin. And they did this for all the plants. Mm-hmm. Uh, they clear away the pl- so they can't crawl from one plant onto the lupin. And then they put the tangle foot around the base of the plant because uh, these plants have like a single stalk that comes out of the ground. So there's no way for an ant to crawl up onto the plant and get to the caterpillars. Okay. So it's like a little kind of invisible fence situation. Yeah. Um, and then for the control plants, they did everything the same and they even still put tangle foot on the, on the branch, on the stem, but they only did it on like half of the side so they could still crawl up. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's a control just in case like clipping the plants nearby, putting the tangle foot had an effect just on its own. Right. All the plants had that. So the only thing that's different is that the ants can get on or not. Right. And so this, this was only in the field for about six days because the caterpillars grow really fast. So once, once they found plants with third and star caterpillars, they put on this treatment and then they monitored them really frequently in any caterpillar that was about to pupate, um, they would collect it and bring it back. So the plants are in the field that have ants and without ants, and they let them grow for a few days where they're exposed to potential predators. Mm-hmm. And Wait, then just to they, stop real quick. Um, yeah. When they put the tangle foot on the plants in the experimental group, are there definitely no ants on the plant at that point? Are they excluding ants from entering the plant and there aren't any on there? They didn't mention that, but other studies I know that did that, like it, you can just like inspect the plant really closely mm-hmm. and just make sure there's none on there. Okay. So it's just um, like basically yeah. some def or some like probably don't have ants or some, let's just say some don't have, the experimental group does not have ants. Yeah. I mean, there's always, you know, normally these things don't work a hundred percent, but right. if you see differences, yeah. But um, like roughly speaking, the experimental group doesn't have ants and the experimental group like probably or could, or probably does. At the very or least the has a group. lot less. Right. Yeah. So okay, cool. often in studies like this, they'll show, they'll also count the, the ants and like confirm they may have done that, but it was a really short paper right. that didn't have those details. So yeah. I don't know if they did that or not. That's um, cool. But yeah, that's so, the general idea, at least. Yeah, so lots of ants, very few ants is mm-hmm. kind of the two treatments. Got it. And so the way you study parasitism is you then collect the caterpillars from those different treatment groups, and you bring them back and you like put them in a petri dish, a closed uh, dish, mm-hmm. and then they'll if they'll pupate, and then if there was a parasitoid inside of it, that parasitoid will um, emerge. It'll bust out from it, and you can see that it was killed by the parasitoid, and a wasp came out. Yeah. And then the ones that don't have a wasp, they'll pupate and that won't happen. And maybe they'll 
you know, if all the conditions are right, they'll turn into a butterfly. Right. So basically you have all these and you count how many wasps came out of. So what they found was that, um, on the controls where there was, there was ants, about 7% of the caterpillars were parasitized. And on the ones without ants, it was about 37%. So pretty, pretty big jump from 7% to 37%. Oh, so wow. ants are, de- are decreasing, um, yeah, by, I don't know, seven, what's seven times X equals 37, five, five times. Crazy. So they're, they're defending the, the butterflies. Yeah, yeah, the cat. So they're like fending off the parasitoids in some way, which is kind of crazy because the parasitoids are re- they're wasp or flies and mm. they're flying around. Yeah. So the ants are there so much that like whenever one tries to fly up, they like beat it back. Yeah. Cool, man. Good bodyguards. Yeah, totally. Um, and they also found that uh, the ones on the control plants they just survived more. So a lot of them disappeared. So they don't know what happened to those. Yeah. So on the on the uh, ant exclusion plants about eighty percent disappeared. Where on the con- on the ones with ants about sixty percent disappeared. So there's oh. other other things that like they may have been caught by other wasp or fallen off the plants or they don't really know. But yeah, the ants are like on the edge of the leaf. Like hey buddy, too too close to the edge, man. Move back in. Yeah. Well, one one thought was that if there's no ants around, the caterpillars might be like, oh screw this, this plant sucks. I'm gonna try to go to another plant. That oh has ants. yeah. They they can't they don't have they don't know what happened it's, right could very well be other predators, mm-hmm. but it could be something else. So that wasn't really like the main result. Yeah, there's not like ants like firing crossbows at like hawks that are coming <laughs> in. <laughs> right, right. Um, so this you know this is just a really clean simple experiment that really shows that uh, the the caterpillars are benefiting a lot from the ants. Um, and it could be mutualism, uh, you know, it's presumably the caterpillars are also benefiting the ants as well, question mark. Mm-hmm. Um, there's no real data on that. Mm. There are ways in which they could not be benefited much. And some studies show that the caterpillars could be secreting liquids that kind of mimic more nutritious liquids. Mm. Ants also, you know, if they were tending aphids, they'd be getting a bunch of sugars and be doing really great. And the caterpillar secretions could smell or taste a lot like the aphids but they might not have much nutrition in them yeah so they could be kind of tricking the ants um, into thinking they have a more nutritious resource than they actually do sort of like a uh a diet coke instead of a coke and it's like yeah tastes pretty much the same to me i guess i'm getting a lot of sugar here right yeah yeah yeah. um so in this study they didn't know if that's what was happening but Mm -hmm. other studies have shown that there's like this um, in some ways, this may not be helping the ants so much because they're kind of being tricked. So, yeah, that study. Maybe let's uh, take a little break. I have a couple more studies to go over. And uh, so we'll take a short break and we'll be back right after this. Right on. All right, we are back. I got a couple more studies to cover on uh, lysenids and their interactions with ants. Now, this one gets into their uh, sound making things. Both of us are musicians, so I thought uh, we'd both be a bit excited about incorporating sound into scientific research. Yeah. So, this study uh, was done by uh, mostly researchers in Taiwan. It was actually published last year, so it's a, a recent study. And uh, in Taiwan, there are some of these lysenid caterpillars that live in trees, and they interact with ants called chromatogaster, which are called crazy ants, which are hmm. super common. I'm sure you've seen, they're like one of the most common groups of ants. They have these little like heart-shaped butts that they hold up into the air. Hmm. Um, if you ever look closely at ants, I'm sure you'll, you'll, they're an easy group to recognize. So they interact with these ants, and the ants have nests in the trees. So they like cluster together leaves. And the caterpillars tend to hang out near these ant nests. Um, and so in this case, the ants also tend to the caterpillars and uh, while they're feeding on the leaves. But they also tend the pupa, which seems kind of crazy. But uh, I don't actually, I don't know. It didn't say where the pupa hang out. Like maybe they pupate somewhere in the tree or I don't know. But Wait, sorry. I'm, I'm already getting slightly lost here. So there's, we've got the ants and we've got the caterpillars. 
And then yeah. we've got the pupa of the, we're talking about the pupa of the caterpillars of the butterfly. Yeah. So like after the caterpillars grow up, before they turn into a butterfly, they pupate and they're a cocoon for mm-hmm. a while. Um, actually in butterflies, it's called a chrysalis. Okay. So they're just like a, 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 a dead looking lump. They're not really, they're just like liquefying their body to turn into, to turn from a caterpillar to a butterfly. So during that stage, when they're locked in a cocoon, they're also being tended by ants for some reason. Okay. Yeah. So they, they knew that beforehand, which kind of informed some of what they did in the study. So as in other systems, they know in the system that um, if you exclude the ants or if there's no ants around, the caterpillars um, have a higher mortality rate. So it's a, a similar situation to the, the ones we talked about on lupins. Yeah. So in this study, they went out to these mountains in Taiwan and they collected a bunch of caterpillars and they also collected ants and they established colonies of these ants in the lab. So they brought them both back to the lab. Mm-hmm. And one of their goals was to try to better understand potential audio communication between the ants and the caterpillars. Mm -hmm. It's known that lots of these caterpillars have these sound making, making organs. Um, and they're normally, they're, they're like, uh, we always call it the fish, that percussion instrument. That's the, the serrated piece of wood and the stick. Right. Uh, The giri, giro, giri, whatever. Giro. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, But essentially like a, a file and scraper system. It's a stridulating, I think it's called, hmm. uh, sound-producing method. That lots of insects do that. That's what the cricket noise is. A, also, a stridulating. It's like bumps that are rubbing against each other and creating a noise. Right. The caterpillars do the same thing. They have a a file and a grinder between their body segments that they can manipulate to make all sorts of noises. Huh. Cool. So they they wanted to specifically see if they're making these noises, if there's a variety of noises, and then try to test if there's evidence for communication. So to do that, they wanted to, they needed to record the sounds. So for almost all these caterpillars, the the sounds are too quiet to hear. Mm -hmm. And they're also mostly just vibrations of a substrate. So they'll sit on a leaf and they basically like vibrate the leaf. Mm. It's not so much traveling through the air, it's like traveling through a substrate. Right, a leaf. (laughs) The leaf, yeah. (laughs) Unnecessarily using big words. so uh, the way they, they, they wanted to record the sounds they make, so they put the caterpillar on a leaf, and then they'd record it for a long time to see if it was making any noises. And the way they recorded it was using a gramophone. Hmm. I think that's the right word. Mm-hmm. Um, and, oh, gra- yeah, gramophone they w- with a stylus that was touching the leaf. Oh, crazy. Yeah. A gramophone is a, essentially like a record player, right? It's just like take it's picking up physical vibrations and then converting it into electrical signal. Yeah. I, that's my understanding as well. Just like a, I mean, it's same as kind of like a record player, just a, any kind of like vinyl record player where it's like a physical, a physical movement that's being translated into sound. So it's like a physical wave that's being converted yeah. to an, uh, I mean, an air wave basically. Yeah. Yeah. And it makes sense that they would do that because like it would be too quiet to, for anything to pick up just right. in the air yeah one little detail that i thought was funny in the paper is that they put in the uh, bit rate that they recorded it at so they're <laughs> apparently pretty audiophile so they did 32 bit at forty eight thousand hertz okay it's, it's not bad pretty pretty high better than cd quality so you know yeah okay so yeah they um they also had to do a ton of noise reduction which is why i, I think the main reason why some of the audio qualities or that audio clips sound kind of crappy. Mm-hmm. I, you know, makes sense. Just other, vi- any vibration of the leaf is going to make a noise. So they had to try to get rid of that. They didn't want to use 96K either. So, you know. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> they had, they had limits. <laughs> uh, so let's, uh, we, there's some, they, in the paper, they had audio clips that they recorded. So let's listen to a couple of those. Okay. So they found that the caterpillars made three different calls and the pupa made it also a call. So there's four different calls. Um, so let's listen to a larva type A call. Okay. Cool. It's kind of like a, a pretty little bird in your backyard in the morning or something. <laughs> Yeah, it's got kind of a trill, similar, look kind of like a cricket. Yeah. Let's uh, check out the the pupa call. Okay. 
Ooh, very aggressive. Yeah, so it's kind of like a, a clicking. Yeah. And then finally, just the last one, listen to the, the ant call. So right. one of the things they discovered um, was that the ants also make calls. I'm not, I don't know that they knew that that was going to be the case. but huh? So yeah, they, listen to the ant call. Okay. Whoa. Dang. They're like barking dogs. Yeah. I, I guess just listening to them, they don't sound that similar to me. But um, they did a bunch of like, audio analysis on them and you know compared to any old noise i guess they do use like some similar frequencies and stuff Mm -hmm. so it supports the idea that they're like they're potentially communicating in similar ways making similar sounds yeah so that was the first so just discovering that the caterpillars overall made four different calls that the pupa also makes a call and the ants make a call so that's sort of the first discovery right the next test is to like try to test if those sounds are resulting in any changes in behavior. So what they did is they took those sounds they recorded and they played them back to the ants. Mm. And so they actually created these little like mesocosms, these little boxes with ants in them. Hmm. And they put a speaker and somehow they like played it back at a volume that was similar to what it would have experienced huh. um, in the wild, I guess. Yeah. A little ant dance club. Yeah. So they would play the different sounds and then they would observe them and and measure their behavior. So there's a few different types of behaviors that they can easily score. Um, One of them is antenation, where they take their antenna and tap on stuff. Mm -hmm. So they could, they, and they would actually do go up to the, to the um, speaker and do this. Mm. So they'd count how many times they'd antenate the speaker. They would quantify how long they spent or how many ants came to the speaker, like aggregation. Mm -hmm. Um, And then guarding, which is kind of like hanging out. I think there's some other thing, some other behavior they do when they're guarding. I think they hold their butts up or something. Mm -hmm. So they could quantify how much time they spent doing each of these. Yeah. And they did that for all of the four caterpillar calls and for the ant call. Mm -hmm. And then as a control, in case they just respond to any noise, they also played like a generic white noise. Okay. Like a sort of like a Celine Dion track, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then uh, they would uh, compare the behavior across all those different treatments. And what they found is that the ants responded to all of the caterpillar calls, especially with going towards it, that especially the aggregation responded most strongly mm-hmm. to the calls. All of the four different calls, um, some of them more than others. but And then uh, they responded a lot more to that than they did the white noise or strangely, the, the ant's own call. So hmm. they weren't really responding much to their own call, which I thought was a little weird. But yeah. maybe it means something else. Like the call they make might not mean come check us out. It could mean something else. Right. Um, so yeah, that was like one of the uh, most solid tests of are are the sounds manipulating the ant's behavior? Yeah. And the fact that the pupa do it as well, maybe th- one of the explanations of why the ants tend the pupa, because they're not getting any secretions from the pupa. It's just there. So they're maybe being tricked by the sound to come check it out. Interesting. Is it not possible that they are aware that they will become the larva, which will then give them the secretions? Um, yeah. From an evolutionary standpoint, that could be the case because, mm-hmm. you know, if it's a big enough fitness advantage to them to keep the ants alive mm-hmm. or the caterpillars alive, it could result in some indirect increase in fitness. Mm-hmm. That seems somewhat unlikely because these ants are never like reliant on the caterpillars. Mm-hmm. It's normally like a small part of their diet. Okay, yeah. So it can be really strong selection on the caterpillar side, but especially for these facultative interactions, it's probably not strong selection on the ant side. Right. But it's it's possible if they're an important enough resource that mm-hmm. it could increase their fitness. So it's more likely that it's they're just kind of the caterpillars are kind of or the pupae are just sort of tapping into something that is like attractive to the ants for another reason. Yeah, mm-hmm. that seems to be what what they think. Mm-hmm. And then the last part of the study was actually showing the organs that the the um, ants are using to make the noise. Um, the caterpillars have been studied a lot, so they kind of know how those work. Mm-hmm. But the the ants, I think, was a new discovery that these ants are making similar sounds. So they they took ants and they they looked at parts of their body with a electron scanning microscope, which is like insanely high detail resolution. <laughs> yeah. Um, and they found a stridulating organ on their gaster, which is essentially their butt, the mm-hmm. final segment of their body. That had, and there's a joint between like the narrowed waist in the gaster where mm-hmm. it bends. Mm-hmm. In between that joint, there's a there's a scraper and a file. 
Hmm. So as they move their butt up and down, it scrapes and makes the, that's what makes the noise. That's so crazy. Yeah. So they're, they're basically like very skilled controlled farts. <laughs> uh, sort of. I mean, they're not, there's not gas being released. Yeah. It's just a physical. Right. Maybe more so they're playing washboard with their butt. Yeah, yeah, right. But the washboard is also part of their butt. Yeah, exactly. They yeah. have both parts of the washboard. Yeah. Um, so that pretty much wraps up that study. So I have I have one more that kind of brings in the most complicated aspects of these interactions. Okay. And is also maybe one of the harder ones to describe. So we'll see how this goes. <laughs> All but, right. Um, I'll put on my understanding goggles. <laughs> I, I think goggles will work great for an audio <laughs> format. <laughs> It's just for me, you know. <laughs> so this is uh, uh, this study is done by uh, a dude named Nash, hmm. not first name, last name Nash, hmm. David Nash, um, and he's in Denmark. And so this is on a group of butterflies that's in Europe um, that have been really well studied for these ant caterpillar interactions. And so these are uh, one of them is called the big blue butterfly. There's a few species in Europe, and. They all, or most of them associate with uh, red ants. Uh, Myrmica is the genus of ants. So there's a bunch of caterpillars and a bunch of different ant species, and they're all interacting in different ways. Mm -hmm. Um, And some of the caterpillar species are really host-specific. So they really only survive if they get into the nest of the right species of ant. And if they get picked up by a different species, they they die. Mm -hmm. So they're very specific, and some of those ants are also really habitat-specific. And so... For both of these reasons, a lot of these butterflies have become really rare and like um, focuses of conservation efforts. Mm -hmm. And the one that's in England has actually been extirpated. It's no longer in the UK. And they found out it's because the ants that it's associated with only live, they really like open prairies that are like grazed or maintained in an open setting. Mm -hmm. And those have become really rare. Mm. So the ants became rare and then the butterfly went extinct. Oh, dang. So a lot of these um, obligate interactions between ants um, and caterpillars, uh, those caterpillars or butterflies tend to be pretty rare right. and also really susceptible to environmental changes and mm-hmm. things. That makes sense. So in this system, the the blue butterflies, they lay their eggs on specific host plants. So they're also dependent on a specific host plant if it's not specific enough already. Um, and the caterpillars feed for a little bit. And then this is the system where... Um, they're found by the ants out in the field. Sometimes they'll find them on the plant or sometimes they'll even fall to the ground and just kind of wait, just like look helpless on the ground waiting for an ant to come by. Hmm. And they smell right. The ants pick them up and carry them back to the nest. And these are those specific examples where some of the species are predators that feed on the larva and some of them are the cuckoos that uh, have the ants um, feed them. Mm-hmm. So given this really strong, tight association, it was thought that this may be a good system where you could have coevolution. So coevolution is where there's multiple species that interact really strongly, mm-hmm. and evolution in one species can then cause evolution in the other species, and then back and forth and back and forth. So classic examples are like flowers with really long flowers, and then moths with giant tongues that go all the way down into them. Right. Or one kind of requires the other to do its thing properly yeah exactly like uh, an adaptation in one species is having really big effects on the um, survival of another species which also has a specific adaptation that matches it yeah so when you have these like matching traits it's really strong evidence for there being some type of coevolution right and so also that some of these coevolutionary dynamics is thought that they could really vary across space so in like one area the ant population could evolve to have like a, you know, in some way, and then the caterpillars would have to evolve to match it. But then on the other side of Denmark, they could evolve in a different way. So you'd have these areas in space where you have different matching traits. Hmm. What, same species or different species? Same species. Yeah. yeah. So like the same pairs of species are interacting in different areas Mm -hmm. and they tend to evolve matching traits in different populations. Wild. So that's something, that's a theory that's been tested in lots of systems. So they wanted to test that in this system. Mm -hmm. And so the trait that they thought would be really important is the smell is, um, is, uh, they're called hydrocarbons. They're these hydrocarbons that are on the skin or cuticular hydrocarbons that are on the skin of the ants and the skin of the caterpillar. And that's what the ants are smelling when they go pick them up. 
And so it's been thought that like, well, if this system's going to work, the caterpillar has to smell just right. Mm -hmm. And if it's not going to smell right, then the ants are going to be like, well, what the hell is this? I'm not going to do anything. Yeah. Do you know what hydrocarbons smell like by any chance? <laughs> well, there's lots of hydrocarbons. I mean, I don't know my chemistry enough. I mean, I think like oil and gas and stuff are hydrocarbons. Okay. So maybe they're, maybe they're gassy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but they're really, um, you know, Hydrocarbons are, they're just made out of hydrogen and carbon and they can interact, they can combine in almost infinite different ways. So right. they're really, really diverse molecules. Mm -hmm. And so it's been found in all sorts of insects. They have really specific and diverse hydrocarbons. So to see if there's this matching and coevolution, they went out to a bunch of different sites in Denmark. Um, they're pretty far away and they sampled ants and they sampled the caterpillars in those same populations. And to just look at the hydrocarbons, they would just pick up the ants and put them in alcohol and they'd extract the hydrocarbons and they could take the hydrocarbons that are in that alcohol solution and measure it with a GCMS, um, uh, which stands for gas chromatography mass spectrometry. Uh, it's, it's hard to say. Okay. Yeah. It essentially like picks up all the weights of the molecules in a solution. Right. And gives you peaks for where those different weights of molecules exist within a thing. So you can see based on these patterns of peaks visually if two substances or two solutions are similar. Right. So it kind of gives you like a key, like an actual physical key where like there's different parts yeah. of the key have like ridges and some have peaks. And you can kind of compare and see if they match. Yeah, totally. Because, yeah, it's not it's not quite the futuristic thing where we can just like know exactly what's in it. It's like a it's like a game. You have to pull the different p puzzle pieces out and like see if these little pieces of evidence line up in right. the same way. Um, so, yeah, it really boils down to a physical or like a, a, a visual mm -hmm. thing that you can look at. Right. And so what they found, not surprisingly, was that in general, the overall uh, chemical composition of the caterpillar is really, really similar to the ants. It's mm. like, on average, they're very, very similar. So it supports the hypothesis that they're matching. Mm -hmm. And then the next thing is that they found that there's a lot of variation from population to population in the ants and in the caterpillars. So that's the next piece you would need to have this sort of trait matching over space. And since they found that there's all this variation and there looks to be matching from population to po population, they then did a second experiment to test if that chemical matching is resulting in mediating the behavior between the ants and the caterpillars. Wait, real quick before you go on there. Um, so when they're doing the, the chemical makeup measurements, they're just looking at the hydrocarbons that like kind of come off their skin or whatever, like it's external stuff, kind of like their, yeah. their juices or their pheromones or whatever. It's like, yeah, it's like body odor. Okay. Yeah. So that's what they're analyzing when they're doing these comparisons. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. I just want to make sure. Yep. And, um, so they did this experiment where they, uh, collected ant colonies from each of those same regions that they sampled from before. So they had at least three different colonies. I think they may have had more, but colonies from these different areas that they knew varied in their, um, smells. And then they collected caterpillars from those same areas as well. And so they did these, again, had these little tiny environments where the ants were living and they could put one of the caterpillars in their environment and then measure how long it took for the caterpillars to quote, get adopted. Hmm. And so how long it takes them to find the caterpillar and then bring it into the nest. Right. They've shown is a measure of like how, you know, how likely they are to get found and likely to survive in the nest. Right. Like just basically a sexiness of measurement. Yeah, sort of. Um, yeah. So previous studies had shown that that was a good metric of like how good the caterpillars are going to survive. Right. For each combination of caterpillar from a location and an ant from a location, they could quantify how similar or dissimilar their smells are and put a number to that. So if they're really different, it's a big number. And if they're, if they're really similar, it's a small number. Okay. Then they also measured how long it took them to get adopted. And if you plot those there's a really strong positive correlation. So if they're really similar, they get adopted like in a couple minutes. Yeah. And if they're really different, it would take them like a hundred minutes. Mm. So that's uh, the sort of the final piece of the puzzle that showed that there's this chemical matching over space and that that goes a long way to mediating um, how strong these interactions are and how effective and how 
uh, the fitness of those caterpillars. Because if they're not getting adopted by ants, they die. Like, that's it. Yeah, yeah. Wild. So, yeah, I think it's a lot of little pieces to show that they're really tightly evolved with each other Mm -hmm. um, and and that these evolutionary changes are happening at a pretty small scale. Like, you even go a few miles over, they're locally adapting to each other. Mm Mm-hmm. And uh, so that the ongoing evolutionary dynamics are affecting their populations. And it also has conservation implications because these are rare butterflies that they're trying to conserve. Mm -hmm. So if you took a butterfly from one population, population A, and then reared them in the lab and then put them out in the wild back over with ants from population B, Mm -hmm. they might not survive because they're not chemically matched to those specific ants. Right, yeah. So maybe just an, another implication if they're doing things to manage these populations that they have to consider the, you know, the, the local adaptation and the evolutionary differences among populations. Right. Like if you pick someone up from Staten Island and then you dropped them off in the Bronx or something, like you'd be like, yeah, it's same, same place. They should be, they should do fine over there. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, they're specifically adapted to their local place. Yeah. Is there any sense of like how long it takes, like how many generations or how fast that like kind of micro evolution happens or anything? Or is that just sort of a, an unknown? Um, I haven't heard that specifically for this system, but lots of other systems in, in insects have found the potential for relatively rapid local adaptation, mm-hmm. even over the course of, um, you know, if they're very abundant, it can happen, you know, even within a season. So mm-hmm. like um, I actually did research on aphids where I studied adaptation over you know only a a few weeks and because they're so incredibly abundant the changes in their growth rates can actually lead to evolution over that short time period now maybe wiped away the next season but there's the possibility for local adaptation over really short time spans but over things that have lifespans of you know like maybe they have a generation a year other studies of like insects that have been introduced to new areas where there's probably really strong selection have found adaptation over you know Tens of years. Mm-hmm. And then one one more just quick follow-up question. Um, it would presumably be the caterpillars adapting to match the ant smells or scents r- versus the other way around, right? It could be both because this is a situation where the selection on the ants could be fairly strong because also in the study they showed if there's a lot of caterpillars, they essentially like kill all the ants Mm -hmm. Um, and actually part of this study was that they may the caterpillars may switch to another host sometimes because there's another ant that they can also match with and that's part of the story they found some evidence that if they're like almost wiping out their one host they may be able to switch to a different host Hmm. other studies have found these host switches of being times where insects can adapt really fast Mm -hmm. um, as well so often it's you know herbivore switching to a new plant but then, yeah, I think they they thought that, you know, in these coevolutionary uh, cases where there's sort of an antagonistic relationship, you can think of which side is winning, quote. And so this case, they thought that the caterpillars were more likely to be winning mm-hmm. because the selection is, even though the caterpillars can wipe out the ants, the selection on the caterpillars is probably way stronger because mm-hmm. they're basically dead if they can't match with the ants right only some of the ant. i mean the the rate of parasitism is still pretty low normally Mm -hmm. and so overall because the selection is a lot stronger on the caterpillars they would predict that it's more likely that um yeah it's like what you said it's more likely that the caterpillars are always adapting to match with the ants Mm -hmm. and kind of one step ahead Mm mm-hmm yeah. Cool. So that kind of wraps up my story about lysinid butterflies. So uh, the stories of uh, predatory butterflies out there. Any uh, any final thoughts? Very cool. Yeah. I mean, uh, it's just a cool window into like how complex nature can be. And just like, you know, you, you take a microscope in on one species and then you like throw another species in there and then you're interacting with them and you, you know, just so many layers of, and, you know, layers of complexity with the ecosystems and stuff. Um, just kind of a little sample of like how complicated and complex the, the earth's ecosystems and kind of biology are, which is very cool. 
Yeah, totally. And I'm, I'm sure that, you know, if you, you dive in even further, I'm sure there's, you know, microbes on their skin that are influencing their smells and, you know, right. stuff like that. And then of course they're always trying to go in and see if they can find genes that are associated with the hydrocarbons and stuff like that. A lot of this research ends up diving into more and more specifics. Right. And another sort of the more macro specifics is, um, is that a, is that an oxymoron? I don't know. Um, <laughs> is they, they look at it from a phylogenetic context so the evolutionary trees of the butterflies so because there's hundreds of the you know there's thousands of species of lysenids and hundreds that are associated with ants if you build an evolutionary tree of all those butterflies you can start to try to answer questions about when they evolved or you know did it only evolve once um you know did this all evolve 100 million years ago or 10 million years ago Mm -hmm. stuff like that so a lot of the research in this area is doing that as well nice that's my jam you like the phylogenetics? Uh, I kind of, yeah. I mean, I think I think it's all exciting. I mean, definitely, like if I was gonna pick either going into the DNA of what's making hydrocarbon smells versus looking at you know evolutionary trees, I would definitely go evolutionary tree route personally. Yeah, for sure. There's there's certain you know personality types that love going into the smaller and smaller things that you can't see, right? Um, and uh, I've always found that not overly appealing as well but yeah. there's lots of people to, that like that so <laughs> yeah it's a good it's a good pairing i think the biggest limitation of this is a lot of it is the field work of like you know you could is just you know because there's thousands of these species we don't know the life history of most of them it's mm-hmm. the amount of work to go out and like observe what they're doing and that's the biggest limiting factor i think to understanding how all of these things work and evolved is like, cause you could build the phylogeny with all the species, but first you have to find them all. <laughs> and then to build a good phylogeny to understand that you'd have to know for every species what it does. Right. And like, that's not even anywhere close. Like it's only a handful of these species that have been studied in detail. Yeah, totally. The mere mortal abilities of humans to observe and understand the massive amounts of complexity that's that's going on out there shows itself yeah and just like i think it it's so limited by just the immense diversity that exists right like thousands and thousands of species yeah it's just you know people devote their life to studying one right <laughs> um, so anyways well i think that wraps up i don't really know how to end podcasts but i'm not going to do all the default things that people normally do <laughs> right well that was fun man thanks for explaining all that cool stuff nice Cool. Well, I guess we'll sign off and uh, I'll talk to you later. All right. Peace. Peace.